In today's Nonsense Wars production, we try to build a better dynamometer car with the LEGO Force Sensor. This powered up compatible device measures three by three by five studs and comes in spike prime or as a standalone part. A button on the 3x3 three three side of the sensor depresses a full stud and measures up to 10 newtons of force or about a kilogram in gravity. Looking at the Pybrix documentation, uh, because Powered Up has none, the force sensor has four outputs, touch, press, force, and distance. Pushing the button gently registers a touch, and pushing it harder eventually registers a press, and the force and distance register pretty much the entire way. Subjectively, force does not register linearly across the button's travel, and it also seems less accurate at lighter loads. Unfortunately, we want to measure forces in the 1 to 2 Newton range. Uh, couplers come apart at about 200 grams. Still, we started with a dynamometer design that directly translated the pull of a locomotive into a push on the force sensor. Using this device, we observed that the HH-1000 registered roughly the same force on our scale and on the sensor, uh, about 200 grams and change, so it seems accurate enough. We decided that we needed a mechanism with some reduction. A 1 to 5 would make a 200 gram force register 1000 grams on the sensor. So we could use up the entire range pulling typical loads. We built a thing with two four bar linkages pinned together. The lower arms are 12 studs long, and the upper arms are 2 studs long, so actually a 1 to 6 reduction. The front bogey also has a color sensor facing downward. We used the color sensor to start and stop measurement. Uh, to keep things consistent, we only wanted to log data on straight track at first. On this layout with two balloon loops, the dynamometer started measuring when it saw green and stopped measuring when it saw yellow. While it recorded, it printed a comma-separated timestamp and force measurement, uh, which we could copy into a CSV, import into Google Sheets, and plot as a graph. For some reason, the force reading would gradually decrease throughout the run, uh, regardless of the direction of the run. We suspected that the dynamometer mechanism would slowly decompress on the straight after compressing more in the turns, uh, ruining the straight line measurement. We decided to try a different test methodology that would more consistently load the sensor. The next setup ran on a long stretch of straight track with no curves at all. The dynamometer would pull up to the starting marker and stop, theoretically releasing any existing tension in the system. 
It then accelerated slowly to full speed, at which point the measurement period started and continued until the color sensor saw the ending marker. While recording, the light on the Technic Hub shone green. At the end of each run, the dynamometer would return and reset itself, and then repeat the entire process three times, ultimately generating three sets of force versus time series, which we could again plot with Google Sheets. The long straight lines connect the end of one run with the beginning of the next because Sheets interprets the data as one series. Unfortunately, we still saw decreasing force on every run. We didn't like two things about this version. The sliding mechanism had a bit of flex and a bit of friction, and the weight of the sensor could push the legs apart, skewing measurements. We tried to add an offset to the output to account for the extra force, but the data still showed decreasing force, and we redesigned the mechanism one more time with the same reduction but only fewer, looser rotational joints. This still didn't solve the perceived problem, and we decided to try an entirely different approach. We would calibrate the force sensor against the scale as accurately as possible, and assume that whatever caused trends in the data did not actually affect the performance of the sensor. For what we want to do, we don't actually care about the force changing. We only care about the accuracy of the measurement as it changes. We ran the dynamometer on a circle and manually started and stopped the recording period. If measurement starts and stops at the same point, any effect a slanted floor has on the data should cancel out. We averaged out the force on the sensor and the speed of the motor and compared our data to the torque curve published by Philo. In an ideal world, our data would fall somewhere on that curve, but of course it didn't. After a bit of consideration, we realized that Philo ran his tests at 9 volts, while we ran at 7.2 volts, uh, because we use rechargeable batteries. For 7.2 volts, we needed to shift the torque curve toward the lower left, setting the new zeros at proportionally lower speed and torque. With that adjustment, our data point actually got very close to the theoretical result. Uh, the leftward deviation will partly come from inaccuracy in measurement, but also from losses due to the friction of the drivetrain. Running the test again at 9 volts with alkalines generated another data point that fell pretty close to Philo's original curve. So we feel pretty good about the rough accuracy of this test methodology. We still have to see if we can use this data to do anything useful but that'll come in part three. On that note, this is the end of the video. Uh, please consider subscribing if you like what we do and have a nice day. Oh. So the tires are like, or is not gonna be good. 
Okay.